yeah, yeah, y'all already know what it is, man. Welcome to the toughest environment to be in. We got Captain Kataza in the building, and of course, Naeem, uh, aka Lord Abba, is in the building. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Lord Abba have oh, a couple of weeks ago, Lord Abba have called out Captain Kataza, and um, the type of the, he called them out, and so cop. <laughs> Captain Kataza have accepted the call out. All call outs are mandatory. Was was Ruth an ethnic Moabite or Israelite? What nationality was Ruth? We're going to get into it, man. Y'all don't want to miss this. This is going to be a great one. Uh, this is Captain Kataza's first um, introduction into the toughest environment to be in. I know he thinks cross the line is the toughest environment, but he is now in the real toughest environment to be in both of you brothers will have three minutes to open up and um the first round and second round the first round is 15 minutes the second round is 10 minutes and after the second round is cross-examination 10 minutes each with each other all right and after that we go back one more round the last and final round the third round is 15 minutes apiece cross-examination that's like um you know uh rebuttaling and y'all both will go back and forth and speak to each other and ask each other questions then you will have three minutes in your closing and um that'll be it we can open up the panel if y'all want to want to open up and take questions we can do that so for now my brother lord abba captain katazar are there any questions no i, I have no questions um i'm ready to get it in I, I was hoping this was going to be to Zariat. He threw, he threw my man out here to be the scapegoat to, to take this <laughs> licking. So, you know, we're we going to have to do what we do. We have to do what we do. All right. Captain Katza, any questions, brother? Nah, I uh, I, I think that uh, it's, it's a good thing, though, that you're going first because uh, otherwise there wouldn't be nothing to rebut. So, you know, at, le at least you're going to be able to say something now. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> okay. Um. I'm trying to find my clock on this daggone phone. Where my clock at? What the hell happened? Did they change my clock? My time? I don't see my timer. Hold on, y'all. Just hold on. It's probably right in front of my face, and I'm blind as a bat. Can't see it. No, I can't see it, y'all. Damn. Oh, damn. There you go. It's on my other page. Okay. Lord Apple, you got three minutes in your opening round, my brother. Time will start when you start. Family, get ready. This is going to be powerful. All right. Yeah. Share my screen, sir. Okay. Your screen is sharing. Are you ready? Yes, I am. All right. So we're going to start right with the book of Ruth. It's as simple as that. Ruth won. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Mahlon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other is Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. And Mahlon and Kilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. You know, you got to get these people out the way to usurp certain people for the biblical codex writers' bloodline. And I'm going to get into that a little bit later. I'm going to skip down some. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. And ye said to her, surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Now, this is, this is clear. There's a distinction being made here between Naomi's people and where Ruth and Orpah are from the land of Moab. I'm going to skip down here. 
it says, and they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, behold, thy sister-in-law is going back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. There's nothing else to debate after this. The book is making it clear that her people is the Moabites. But she's saying, I want your people to be my people, Naomi. I want your God to be my God, Naomi. All sources, every last source that I've seen call Ruth and Orpah converts. Converts from the Moabite way and the Moabite religion. So, you know, that's my opening and I'm going to get into the rest of it during my rounds. Their book is clear on who uh, Ruth was. She was, in fact, a Moabite, period. I don't see what else there is to debate after this. So I'm just going to be teaching from here on now. I yield the rest of my time. All right. Thank you, Brother Lord. I have a powerful opening. Um, yes. Um, time will start when you're ready, Captain. No sweat. Yeah, we could just get straight to this. Um, this is why you understand not everybody's authorized to teach the Bible. You know what I'm saying? Just straight up and down. What we're going to show here today is that not only was Ruth ethnically an Israelite, but that y'all don't even understand where the story of Ruth takes place. Ruth doesn't take place below the Arnon River where the actual Moabites were. It takes place in a portion of the land that used to belong to Moab that was conquered by another nation that Israel conquered and then gave to Reuben. See, see the problem is y'all study geography, y'all don't study history. You understand? You just read something and take it literal. Like, like this is why people think snakes can talk in the Bible. This is why I think reindeer fly and rabbits lay eggs because y'all don't know the history. I don't understand anything that goes on inside this Bible. So what we're going to prove without a shadow of a doubt is that the story of Ruth even took place in the land of Israel. And that Ruth was just from another tribe who was moving back into, you understand, their land of Judah so that this way her children could now take on the inheritance, you understand, through the law of the kinsmen. It's going to be real smooth. You understand? Like I said, you, you lucky that you're going. I shouldn't even say lucky. You understand? But it's a good thing that you the challenger and you going first because now you could at least get a couple of words out. All right. I got I I'll got yield the rest of my time. There's, there's, there's a layup. All right, man. Powerful comeback right there. Uh, Brother Lord Abba, let's get it up. Let's uh, pause. All right. Uh, so. Uh, Hold on, brother. Let me finish it. Let me. Oh, uh, no, my bad. My bad. Give me my 15 bad. minutes in this first round, and time will begin when you're ready. All right, share my screen, sir. Let's get yes, into this screen, real quick. Your screen is sharing. Are you All ready? All right, easy work. Easy work. All time. right, round one. Uh, say it again. Time starts. Okay, round one. Ruth was a more biters. And I have these images here because I am going to get into the historical record because this man right here who gave me this understanding to dig a little bit deeper said some key things and it led me on a path, on a path to uncover who the true Moabites was and uncovering who we were here in the United States of America. So from the Morris American questionnaire, we cite, what was the nationality of Ruth? Ruth was a Moabitess. Every single authority says this. What is the modern name for Moabites? Moroccans. I'm going to I'm going to get into some of this later, being that I've already proven through their own book that Ruth was a Moabite. This is from familysearch.org. This is one of the top genealogical websites in the country, and on it it has the genealogy of Ruth using the Midrashim. It cites Eglon as the father of Ruth. Let's read it. Ruth Bat, wait, brief life history of Ruth. Ruth Bat Eglon of Moab was born from about 1340 BC to 1315 BC as the daughter of Eglon Ben Balak. 
king of Moabites and Amalekites, and Eglon bit Yehozbad, queen of Moabites and Amalekites. She married Mahlon bin Elamelech in 1225 BC in Moab. Every single authority says the same thing that Ruth was a Moabitess, and every Midrashic interpretation gives, or exegesis, I should say, gives the breakdown that Ruth was in fact the daughter of Eglon. And we know that the, what the Bible does, right? The Bible disses its enemies like, they, like it does in Judges 3. And I'm going to read this line. It says, he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. So the Bible is now Bible is fat shaming this man because he is heavy set. Now I gotta say, you know, I don't looked at some of you one West brothers, and um, you know, you know, if the shoe fit, if the shoe fits, you know, let me just run through some of this. Let's get into the origin story of the, of uh, Moab and Ben Ami. This is Lot and his daughters. And for those of you that know the story, you know that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. Lot's wife turned back and turned, looked back, I should say, and turned into a pillar of salt after God told them not to look back. They're biblical God. Let's, let's read this. Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their, they made their father, Lot was a righteous man, drink wine that night also. You know this story is made up. They have to give you a shameful origin of their biblical enemies. And then the younger one arose and lay with him. And he perceived not when she lay down or when she arose. Thus were born both, excuse me, thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger, she also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ami. The same is the father of the children of Ammon until this day. The crazy thing is, Lot is not punished for this act by the biblical God. Lot's daughters are not punished by this act, that this, this act that they've done by the biblical God. This is another way to shame our bloodline because the people that wrote this book do not look like us. In fact, no offense, they look like this brother that I'm debating here tonight. So they have to give this shameful origin of, of, of Moab and Ben-Ami. Now, in order to usurp Ruth into their bloodline, let us look at her husband. His name was Malon, which means sick. Think about it. Who names their baby sick? You ever heard somebody said, this is a beautiful baby boy. I'm going to name him sickness. What was the other brother, Kilion's name? What did it mean? Pining. What does pining mean according to the Hebrew lexicon? Wasting away. When we look in the dictionary, pine means to suffer a mental and physical decline. Who would name their child something after a physical and mental decline? This is proving that this is just a concocted story because they have to usurp the bloodline of Ruth. This is the Haggai Mazuz. This is the School of International Studies. Sun Yat-sen University, China. Why did I use this particular source? Because I just asked to Zariak a week ago, do he still teach that the Moabites were Chinese and the Ammonites were Japanese? This is false and as frivolous as Ruth being an Israelite. Let's read. The linkage of Ammon and Moab with pre-Islamic Arabs and Muslims and Jewish sources prevalence and motives. This is important to understand the true history of the Moabites, not that mumbo jumbo that you're going to hear from this ISUPK camp. Abstract. Jewish sources commonly refer to Muslims as Ishmaelites. We've heard Tazariak say that a thousand times. And to Islam them as the kingdom of Ishmael due to an alleged biblical genealogy that both Jews and Muslims accept. Other classic Jewish sources however, associate pre-Islamic Arabs as well as Muslims with two other biblical nations, Ammon and Moab, even when and even though the standard appellations are at hand. The Ammon and Moab nexus is mentioned in academic literature, but without much elaboration. The article continues, 
This is of research interest because some midrashim and comparisons, such as Sifar Debarim, I don't know if I'm pronouncing these right, Mechlita de Rabbi Ismael, present Moab and Ammon as entities separate from the sons of Ishmael. See, their whole understanding is warped. And that's why I wanted to take this debate. I wanted to take this debate so that I can put things back into their proper perspectives. And that article spoke about how the later texts reinvented these people. They reinvented Ammon and Moab and Ishmael. One of the sites, sites they uh, cite, excuse me, sources they cite is the Perk D. Rabbi Eliezer, right? And we know that this goes back to the 8th century AD. For those that are familiar with it, I've been familiar with it for the past 15 years. It says, Ishmael sent for and married a wife from the wilderness of Moab named Aisha. Three years later, Abraham went to see Ishmael, his son, and vowed to Sarah that he would not dismount from the camel wherever Ishmael would be present. He reached the place in midday and found Ishmael's wife there. He asked her, where is Ishmael? She replied, he and his mother went to bring date fruits from the desert. He told her, give me some bread and some water for my soul is fatigued from the desert journey. Those that know the Bible understand this bread and water reference in regards to Moab and Israel. She told him, quote, there is neither bread nor water. He said to her, when Ishmael comes in, tell him these things and say to him that an old man came from the land of Canaan to see you and said that the threshold of the house is not good. When Ishmael came in, his wife told him this thing and he divorced her. That name Aisha links to that region because we know that Prophet Muhammad's wife his name was Aisha. It links to ancient Arabia where the Moabites were situated. This is a fact that I'm going to prove later on in this debate. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Noble Drew Ali said the foundation of Christianity began in Rome. And I got to give honors to Noble Drew Ali. Without him, I do not have this knowledge. I just don't rock with the MST of A no more. Shout out to my haters. Y'all know, I know y'all watching. The Roman nations founded the first church of whom crucified Jesus of Nazareth. That's new information for those that want to do some research for seeking to redeem his people from under the Roman yoke and law. But Jesus himself was of the true blood of the ancient Canaanites, Moabites, and the inhabitants of Africa. This is why I wanted to have this debate. Look at the date on this. November 12, 2014. This was Tazariak's comment to me. He called me a dumb. I ain't going to say the words. You don't want no profanity. Right. And he said, what's a joke is trying to use the word of the Lord for the Israelites, for a nation that doesn't exist as a nation. The Moors were not and never will be a nation. And that's false because the Moors have had several national names with Moab being the primary one. Let us prove it from the book H.T. Norris, the Berbers in Arabic literature. It reads, there were other Moors. They were the Saharan, the Saharans of Sahelian Takroris. They were not fictitious and Christendom knew them by a biblical name, the Moabites. Moabites were the Almoravids who although Sanhaja Berbers from the Sahara also claimed to be descendants of the Hemiorite Arabs of the, Yen of the Yemen. So we have the Moors, we have the Moabites and we have the true and the original Arabs. Again, I'm gonna show some sources later. This is the Sahel region that stretches from Eritrea all the way to the west coast of Africa. You can see all the countries there. The first, they formed the uh, country called Takror, or at least historians call it Takror. In 1000 AD, they are the first African nation to accept Islam. They are the ones that go into Europe as the Almoravids. Almoravids simply means Moabite, and we're going to prove that here the translation from the saga of Charlemagne and his heroes. Let us, let us, let us prove this. So I'm going to skip where it says King Fantine of Moab, excuse me, King Fantine of Mara, right? And we see it's a reference to number six. And we see that Morocco is the name for Marab in their original breakdown of the language. Marab is nothing more than another word for Moab. And we prove it in its glossaries of proper names. Moabites, Morabites, al Moravis, M-O-R-A-B and M-A-R-A-B. If you've studied the topic like I have, 
is the same exact word. And we see Mar'ab, Marak, Morocco. So when Noble Drew Ali is speaking about Moabites being Moroccans, he's not talking about the people there. He's saying that this is the true name of that region whose original name is Mara. I hope y'all brothers in the MSC of A and sisters are taking notes. Here are some sources. The world of Ed Sid, Chronicles of the Spanish Reconquest by Simon. This is important for you all to see. Mustering the army of Toledo and Castile, both knights and foot soldiers, he went to the land of the Moabites and the Hagarenes. These are the Moors that are in Europe. Here's another one. It says, great troops of horsemen of the Arabs and the Moabites. And there were countless horsemen, cro uh, crossbowmen, and foot soldiers. This is why the biblical narrative tries to do Ruth in the way that it does her by usurping her bloodline, because this is us. These are our people. Another source, the victors and the vanquished. Christians and Muslims of Catalonia and Aragon between 1050 and 1300. When the native Muslims of Al-Andalus rose up in rebellion against the Almoravids in the middle of the 12th century, their animosity was of such fervor that it provoked comment in Castilian chronicles. With, quote, I mean, excuse me, with dramatic license, one such chronicle gave voice to Andalusi discontent. Quote, the Moabites eat of the fat of the land and our properties. They carry off gold and silver from us. They oppress our wives and children. These are Moors. These are not Japanese. These are not Chinese. These are the direct descendants of the bloodline of Ruth herself, the direct descendants of Egon and Balak, who the Bible disparages because that is not our book. And this is why this is important. This is from a panorama of nations, journey among the families of men. The great cause of this animosity, because the Mozabites at the time were being excluded from the masjids there, it says the great cause of this animosity is found in the assertion which the Jews have made for ages, that the Mozabites are the Moabites who conquered Israel and were conquered in turn by the Babylonians whom they assisted to subdue Palestine, who were worshipers of Baal, both the religious and national enemies of the Hebrew people a portion of whom immigrated to the West and with the other idolatrous foes of the Jews, the Ammonites disappeared for a time from the light of history. Among the coast of Zanzibar, also, there is a numerous people called the Waled One Amar, minute. One minute. the Jews assert to be the children of Ammon. It has been custom of the Mozabites for several ages after performing the pilgrimage to Mecca to go into this country in order to visit their acknowledged Brethren, this is from the Library of Congress. It dates back to the 1890s. This is an actual picture of a Mozabite. These are the different words. I know I only got one minute left. The crescent moon and the star has been associated with the Moabites from at least the 14th century as a, a as an official name seal. That is from this book called The Moabites, published in 1960. Gods, goddesses, and images of God, we find the same exact thing. The combination of a crescent moon and a single star, usually six rayed, appears more or more frequently on more bite name seals. We see the insignias, if you will, of the MST of A, the Nation of Islam, the Fafa Sinners, the Ansar Law community. Once these things got taken away, our light diminished in this country. And that's why I needed to do this debate right here. Yeah, I'm gonna call you later. Call you back. Yo, listen, man. You going in, Lord App. I mean, um, you going in, brother. Captain Kataza, are you ready, brother? You can hear me? Loud and clear. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. Wow. Um, my bad, Lord App. I should have let you know five minutes before instead of saying one. That's cool. Uh, That's cool. I knew where I was at on the time. No. You got to uh, help me on the second round because I didn't time that one. Yes. Y'all can see this, right? All right. Uh, yes, we see it. It's up and running. Let me know when you're ready. You got 15 minutes. Um, if I were you, I would use every second of my time, even if I finish beforehand. <sighs> you go in. All right. All right, so let's begin. First of all, uh, I want to commend this brother for taking the lampshade off his head. You know what I'm saying? It's it's about time, you know what I'm saying, you left that circus performer's religion. You know what I'm saying? When we turn around and we look at this, first of all, I don't know. 
I don't know. What's up? Pause your time. I got to pause your time. We're going to start this thing over. Um, your mic be going in and out. I want everybody to hear every word so they won't mess up. You know, your mic be going in and out. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. You ready? Um, I've been ready. Okay. Time start. All right. So once again, uh, let's, let's, you know what I'm saying? Get his brother a little honor for taking the lampshade off his head. You know what I'm saying? Now, back to what we're saying, right? When it comes down to Ruth, what we're going to read inside of Deuteronomy, the 29th chapter, right? Is that these are the words of the covenant, which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab. We're talking about Ruth's identity. We're not talking about who you believe the Moabites to be. I, brother, I don't know how you even think that you'd be ready to debate Captain Zayak when you don't even know the topic of debate. What we're talking about is Ruth's ethnicity. Is she an Israelite or is she a Moabite? But what we're reading about in Deuteronomy, the 29th chapter, is that the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb, where is this land of Moab that we're speaking of here? That's what we need to find out right now. So now it says in verse eight, and they took the land and gave it for an inheritance onto the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to half the tribe of Manasseh. Why? What are we speaking of? I want you to take a look at this map right here, right? I want you to take a look at Mount Pisgah, Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo is going to be extremely important when it comes down to this debate. Heshbon, all these different areas that's on this map right now, because this is where the story of Ruth takes place. When you read Ruth 1 and 1, it says it took place in the country of Moab, the plains of Moab, the land of Moab. All of these are synonymous contextually with this area right here. So when Israel first came in to conquer, what they did was look on the bottom where you see where the actual land of Moab is. That's below the Arnon River. Above that is Reuben. What do we just read about? We just read about Gad. We just read about Reuben. And we just read about Manasseh getting their inheritance on this side of the Jordan. And all this was a former territory of Og and, and Shihon. And we took that land from them, but they took that land from Moab. So when you look, this is east of Jericho. So we're about to find out on all these maps geographically that this story took place in the land of Reuben. Let's keep going. So now look at the Arnon River, Moab, and now look up on the screen. You're going to see Israel's camp was at Mount Nebo, Beth Jeshemoth, east of Jericho. This is the land that this story is taking place. Let's keep going. Now, when it turns around and it says that Ruth is a Moabite Tish damsel, you know, anybody will turn around and say ish means pertaining to. You think that the translators of the King James Version don't know when to put it or when to put ish? Ish means kind of like pertaining to. Why would they put Moabite Tish? Well, let's find out what this actually means. When you go inside the blue letter, you'll find out that this is not a daughter of Moab. This is not, you understand what he said, uh, uh, Bon or Bagal, whatever the hell, you understand that fake source was. Because you're talking about the people who look like me and then you pull the source from the Talmud? Come on, bro. Let's be real. This is not Mawaab. This is Mawaab Ya, meaning what? It means an inhabitant of the land of, you know, kind of like I'm a New Yorker. You understand? Like I I'm from New York. I inhabit the land of New York. Well, she was living in a land that used to belong to Moab that they still called Moab. You know, if you in Harlem, they tried to rename Harlem to Soha. Ain't nobody calling Harlem Soha. We call in Harlem, Harlem, just like we still call Clinton Hell's Kitchen. You understand? Well, they still called that the plains of Moab. Let's continue. Deuteronomy 32 and 49. Get thee up into the into this mountain, Abarim, onto Mount Nebo. Remember where I showed you Mount Nebo was? It was in the land of Reuben, which is in the land of Moab. Is this the actual land of Moab? No, this is north of the Arnon River that is over and against Jericho. And behold, the land of Canaan, which I give on to the children of Israel for a possession, because this is land we conquered that was still called Moab. Now, you can go and you can get yourself a Zondervan Bible Pictorial Dictionary. This is like Israelite 101. You understand? Zondervan is a very well-respected, you understand, uh, historically accurate biblical dictionary now when we look right there's two pages here we have nebo the first definition a god of babylonian mythology nope that's not it let's go to definition number two 
right over here. The name of the mountain from which Moses beheld the promised land. Where was that? That was inside of Reuben's land, a Moabite town near or on Mount Nebo. That's why I said Mount Nebo is so important because where's Mount Nebo? It's east of Jericho and it's in the land of Reuben above the Arnon River where the actual Moabites, not Moabitish people live, but the Moabites lived. Here's Mount Nebo. Do we have to go back? A town mentioned, hold up, a Moabite town or on Mount Nebo. Well, it used to belong to Moab. It now belongs to Israel. I know you don't know this. You don't, you don't study maps. You understand? And I ain't no cartographer. I don't draw maps. Ain't none of these mine. We're going to keep pulling up maps. Do you understand? When they came in, they came in right over here. And here's what you're going to see. Here's Jericho. Here's Mount Nebo. Where is Mount Nebo? In the land of Reuben because Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben from Gilead on down, this was the inheritance that was given on to them. Let's continue on. Deuteronomy 34 and 1. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab onto the mountain of Nebo. Well, do, do we have to go backwards? Oh, where's Mount Nebo? In the land of Reuben, because this was our newly conquered territory. Onto the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah that is over and against Jericho. Let's go back. Here's Jericho. You understand? Here's Mount Nebo. This is the plains of Moab. You understand? Let's keep going. So now, and it says, and he showed him all of the land of Gilead onto Dan. Here is Gilead. This is all the way above where you believe that Moab is located because this land used to belong to Moab. I'm going to keep reiterating that. I got to drill that into your brain. So now, if we keep looking, here's another map. Here's Jericho. What's east of Jericho? The plains of Moab, Mount Peor, Hezbon, Mount Nebo. And that is above Moab all the way up to Gilead because this is the land that was given onto Manasseh, onto Gad, onto Reuben. Let's continue on. The plains of Moab. Where is that? In the land of Reuben, east of Jericho. Another map because this is where the Israelite encampment happened before they crossed the Jordan and went to conquer the rest of the promised land. Let's look on further. Land taken from Shion by Israel because once upon a time ago, all this land belonged to Moab. Shion took this land from Moab all the way up to the Arnon River, up to this border. And when Israel came in, we took it from them. And here are the plains of Moab, which is why she was Moabite Tish, Ish, an inhabitant of the land of. So now let's continue reading. Let's read about this history. Deuteronomy 34. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab onto mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah that is over and against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead onto Dan and Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh and all Judah onto the sea. So what you see here is verse five. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab. Where is this? This is in the plains south of Jericho. This is, you understand, he says, and he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab over and against Beth Peor. So this once again is not literally in Moab's land. This is all in the land of Reuben. When you look on these maps, you can see plains of Moab. This is the land of Moab. This is Mount Nebo. This is the land, you understand, where Moses was on this mountain overlooking the promised land. And he left this to the Reubenites. Let's continue on. Here's Jericho. Here's Jordan. Here's the plains of Moab. And here's Baal Peor, just like it said, right next to Mount Nebo. Let's continue on. You can read this in the book of Joshua. You understand? You can read this all throughout the scripture. And Moses gave an inheritance. This is verse 29. Onto half the tribe of Manasseh. And this was the possession of half the tribe of the children of Manasseh of their families. Why? Because this is where he gave them their inheritance. I'm going to start at verse 27 so you could see where this was. And in the valley of Bethram and Bethimara and Succoth and Zapan, the rest of the kingdom of Sihon of Heshbron. Remember, that's where we're at. We conquered this from Sihon. Jordan and his border, even onto the edge of the sea, eastward of Jordan. 
That's exactly where we are right now. Verse 32. These are the countries which Moses did distribute for inheritance in the plains of Moab on the other side of the Jordan by Jericho eastward. Because that's where Reuben is. Here's the Jericho. Here's Eastwood. The other side of the Jordan River, Mount Nebo. Because we took this from that King Sihon when we conquered all the way up to Gilead and beyond. For Manasseh, for Gad, and for Reuben. Let's continue Five on. Minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Perfect. Numbers 21. And from Bamath in the valley that is in the country of Moab, because where does the story of Ruth take place? In the country of Moab to the top of Pisgah, which looketh toward Jeshemon. Well, once again, where are we at? Check the map. Once again, here's Mount Pisgah. Here's Bamath Baal. Here's Nebo. And where is all of that? All of that is inside the land of Reuben. Here's the Ford of Jordan. Here's Pisgah. Here's Hermon. Here's the plains of Moab. Another map. Here's, here's the plains of Moab. Here's Bamath, Nebo, Pisgah, Heshbon. All the areas that we're reading about is in the land of Reuben. Bamath by all that we just read about in that verse, Numbers, the 21st chapter. What does it say that this place is? A place north of the Arnon. Remember, below the Arnon is where the Moabites really lived. Bamath Baal, where it's talking about that this inheritance was given, is north of the Arnon, in the tribe of Reuben. I mean, it, I don't, I, it doesn't get more clearer than this. So when you look up country of Moab, you understand, in the Blue Letter Bible, you're going to see that Numbers 21 is the same entry as Ruth. Now, when it comes to pass in the days when Judges ruled, Ruth takes place during the time of Judges. She's contemporary with the book of Judges. That there was famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. What country of Moab? The same country of Moab. That's the plains of Moab. That is here in the land of Reuben. Like this is ABC 1, 2, 3. You understand? Ruth 2 and 6. Moabitish. Now. This is where, out of the country, that word is Shaddah. What does it mean? Field, land, cultivated field, plain as opposed to mountains. Why? You have Mount Nebo, and outside the mountain of Nebo, you have the plains. Now, why is this so important? Why does all this fit into this contextually? Let's read. Numbers 32. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, these are all the places we've been reading about right now. That's east of Jordan, north of the Arnon River. And it says that, behold, this was a place, this, the place was a place for cattle. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the princes of the congregation saying, you understand? I'm going to drop down to verse four. Even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle and thy servants have cattle. So as a result, they wanted these plains. They said, let us inherit on this side so that this way it's good for our cattle. So they didn't cross the Jordan. So Moses made a deal with them. And he said that you can have this side. But when we go to fight, you have to send soldiers. You understand? Like this is this is very simple. This is not rocket science. Si, you said that I was going to need all my time. You understand? And I, I really don't You understand to bust this down. But this is what I need everybody to know. This story is about Ruth, who is an Israelite, and it's talking about how she's a stranger, meaning she's from another territory than the Israelites, but they show her brotherhood, sister, sisterhood, love. And what happens is it's also brotherhood according to inheritance because the nearest of kin marries into this family to make sure that they do not lose their land or lose their inheritance. That is what the story of Ruth is about. Now, I would love for you to actually come and not debate me on who you believe the Moabites are today. We're talking about is Ruth an Israelite or a Moabite? And what I just proved without a shadow of a doubt is that the story of Ruth takes place in the land of Reuben. It takes place 
east of Jericho and above the Arnon River during the time of Judges. I'll yield the rest of my time. All right. Powerful, powerful response. Powerful comeback. Uh, Captain Katazat, uh, Lord Abba, you got 10 minutes in the second round, beloved. 10 oh, minutes gosh. in the second round. Time so, when you start, brother. You got right, your, screen so, up, your screen up? Yep, yep, because I'm going to go back. Hold yeah, on. I forgot to tell y'all, too. If y'all ever need me to hold your time to get something, you got to let me know. I don't know. All right. Um, Lord Abba, your screen is up and ready. Let me know when All you're right. ready. You know, he took he took a little shot at the feds, but he rocking the Versace belt yeah, on top of his joint. I got I got to get my little get back on Tom. that one, but I ain't rocking I ain't rocking the feds no more. So I'm just gonna go back to Ruth, and then I'll get back into it because I opened up with Ruth, proving Ruth was a Moabite, and then I got into the history. I hope people didn't get lost. I had to prove that there's a history here that is being discounted by biblical believers because they are following behind the biblical codex writers that use this book to rule the world and pretty much brainwash the minds of my people. Now, let me start again. Ruth 1. Now, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons, they went to sojourn in the country of Moab. This dude showed a whole bunch of maps that didn't mean anything, absolutely nothing. And the name of the man was Eli Melech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Milan and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Eli Melech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left in her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. This is clear, that they took wives of the women of Moab, not the women of Reuben or Gad or wherever else he was showing on the map. His own book says this, which is why he couldn't use his own book to debunk the claim that she was a Moabite or prove his claim that she was an Israelite. It says, and Mahlon and Kilion died, also both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Uh, then I'll, I'll just read it. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. From, for she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. Wherefore, she went forth out of that place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah, meaning from Moab, where Ruth and Orpah were from, because they were Moabites. And Naomi said unto her, daughter, her two daughters-in-law, go, return each to her mother's house, meaning go back to your people. Your people are the Moabites. The Lord deal kindly with you as he have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Not saying my long lost people that are Israelites in another land. They're saying as Moabites, we're going to return with you, Naomi, to your people. And Naomi said, turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way. For I am too old to have an husband. And if you understand the, the Israelite or the Hebrew tradi traditions, you would understand why she's saying this. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them until they are grown, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we could skip down to this part. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, behold, thy sister-in-law is going back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. 
thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. This is clear that Ruth is speaking to her own ethnic or national identity. And she's saying, I want to go with you. I want to give up my ethnic or national identity. And I want to be of your people, hence thy people. I don't want to worship my God anymore. I want to worship your God, hence thy God, my God. I don't know what this brother was talking about. That's why I wanted to show the history. Stop sharing my screen, side and, and pause my time real quick so I could pull up this other. I mean, the, the, the debate is over. I don't know what anybody is thinking about. Time is paused at 523. Five minutes, 23 seconds. Okay, I got you. Let's I go. Got you. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to get back into, no, into okay. some of okay. you getting your stuff. Come all on. Right, all right. I got you. I got yeah, you. Yeah, just pick go. up your stuff. Let's go. Because I could skip some of this other stuff I got. You got five minutes, 23 seconds. All right. Come on. You can start my time back. Time resume. Hold on. Let me put this up. All right. Time resume. All right. So here we go. Second round. I, I was going to get into the connection between Ruth's Moab nation, Judah, the Moors, Egypt, and the original Arabians. But I'm a, I, I'll slow walk through that. So he said ish, right? Because this is the pseudo-isms that people like he and a lot of these different camps and a lot of different people employ. We heard my last opponent try to make this same silly argument, which proves that he isn't studied at all. But when you look at this word forming ish, it is an adjectival word form because they mean kind of sort of, right? That's not, not that she's a Moabite, but she's kind of sort of a Moabite because she's in some land at the, nah, get out of here with that. Ish is an adjectival word forming element from the old English isk of the nativity or country of. This is a quote of the nativity or country of. So when it is saying Moabitish woman, it means because she is a native of that country and later use of the nature of character of from Proto-Germanic Iska. And you know, you run through all of these cognate with Greek diminutive suff suffix Iskos in its oldest forms with altered stem vowels and it gives you breakdowns. But look at what it says at the very bottom. Colloquially, colloquially attached to hours to, a, to denote approximation 1916. That means you don't get ish, meaning like what time we started this debate, Sa, eight ish? Right, because we didn't start at eight on the dot, so we started eight ish. This doesn't come into play until 1916. This man tried to deceive y'all and said the biblical codex writers wrote Moabitish to show y'all that it means that in that day when they wrote this text, they meant that she was kind of sort of a Moabite woman. Get that up out of here, man. Ether, I wanted to go back to this because he brought up Manessa and I brought up the Moabite name seals, and we know that Manessa is the half tribe. The archaeological research shows that the combination of a crescent moon and a single star, usually six rayed, appears more frequently on Moabite name seals. The seal belonging to Manessa, the king's son of unknown provenance, has been classified by scholars in more recent times as Moabite. I don't have the time to really go through a lot of what I what I want to go through here. So, you know, let me know when I'm about a minute or two minutes left, Sa. Si. So I'm going to come from this book, Egyptian Romany, because I want to get back into the history, because he got to make up fairy tales. I'm giving you history. Go back and watch that first round. The Moabite region, Mustafa Gadala says, was also the source of the Arabic, Hebrew, and Aramaic slash Syriac dialects which were offshoots of the ancient Egypt language. Ibn Hazm, who died in 1064, the medieval Arabic scholar of Cordoba, recognized that Aramaic, Syriac, Hebrew, and Arabic were kindred dialects derived from the Mudar, the dialect in which the Quran had been disclosed. Later in chapter 12, we will show that Mudar is an ancient Egyptian term meaning language, and that all three languages, dialects, are offshoots of the ancient Egyptian language. The Moorish alliance never forgot their Moabite origin. Christian chronicles sometimes refer to the Almoravids as Moabites. 
There are numerous references to the Moabites in the Chronica et Afonte, and it gives you all of the different pages and references to these paragraphs. And the reference to Ali and Tesafinas as king of the Moabites would seem to support their theory that this term refers to the Almoravids. I showed that already earlier. There's a reason why I wanted to get into the history. I wanted to show people that we're playing with two, two different decks here. They're playing with make-believe and fiction. And we're dealing with the truth and the actual facts. And there's a reason why our people are in the decline that they are in now. So let me read from this source right here. This is from Florian, the origin of the Moors. It says the origin of the Moors or Mauritanians is like that of most other ancient nations, obscure. And in the information we possess concerning their history, confusedly mingled with fables. The fact, however, appears to be established that Asiatic immigrations were from the earliest times made into Africa. In addition to this, the historians of remote ages speak of a certain Melik Yafrit, king of Arabia Felix, who conducted a people called Sibai into Libya. Libya is anciently the northern portions of what we know of as Africa today, and that he made himself master of that country, established his followers there, and gave it the name of Africa. It is from these Sabians or Sabai that the principal Moorish tribes pretend to trace their, their descent. The derivation of the name Moors is also supposed in some degree to confirm the impression that they came originally from Asia. Now, when they're saying Asia, they're talking about the same area that Kaktazar was showing in the maps. But without him looking... All right, man. The 10 minutes is up. Captain Kaktazar is on you. And uh, right after this, Lord Abba, what you should be doing is getting ready for the cross-examination. Right after this, y'all will be cross-examining each other. Y'all have a minute, I mean, uh, a minute to answer the questions of each other. Uh, time will start when you're ready, Captain. All right, let me know if you could see this on the screen. Yes, it's up there. It's up there right now? Yep. All right, let here we go. go. Right. So now... Let me show you why he doesn't know the Bible at all. Ruth 1 and 1 says, Now it came to pass in the days when judges ruled. Remember what I said earlier. Now notice he did not say anything when I showed you where the country of Moab is and where this story takes place. Why didn't you refute any, 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 any of the maps? Uh oh, you, you, you didn't study any of this. I understand. I, I know you don't know no better. So now... This story takes place when? During when judges ruled. And it takes place where? In the country of Moab, which is actually inside the land of Reuben. But there's something very important here. That verse that he keeps reading, there's a couple of things that he doesn't know. So when it says Ruth 1 and 16, and Ruth says, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. And whether thou lodge, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. First of all, let's look at that word. God. What we would pronounce in ancient Hebrew is, as Allahayim, y'all might say as Elohim, H430. Now, why is this so important? Because that word right there, it means powers, judges, rulers, or authorities. Let's look right here, if y'all can still see the screen. A, rulers, judges. When is it that this story took place again? Oh, you mean Ruth took place during the time of the judges. Well, let me show you something about the judges. Remember, she said what? She said that your God shall be my God. So now I'm going to show you. We're going to go to Exodus 22 and 28. So I just got to search that. Hold on. Let's go to Exodus 22. Now, remember, it's that word. Allahim or Elohim. Now, what does this say right here? Thou shalt, this is Exodus 22 and 28, thou shalt not revile the gods. Is this talking about idols? Nor curse the ruler of thy people. Why? Because it's that same word when it says gods, Elohim, H430. So what was it talking about? Well, Ruth took place when? During the time of judges. Well, let's show you something else. Let's go to Exodus 21. So we're going to go to Exodus 
the 21st chapter. Now let's go to verse six. Then his master shall bring him onto the judges. Let's open this up and see what word judges is. Oh, the judges, Allah When we read in the book of Ruth and it says, your God shall be my gods, it's saying your judges shall be my judges. Because during the book of judges, there were judges in all the gates of all the tribes of Israel. But Kataza, what about the my people part? It says my people. Clearly, it's talking about different people. Well, why don't we go to the book of Judges and see? This is this is what people don't understand. Israel was not a united monarchy until King Solomon, King David's reign. And David, in order for him to rule, he had to go and he had to conquer Israel through civil war. So if y'all can still see this screen, right? This is Judges 1. No, I want Judges 12. I want to go to Judges, the 12th. Hold up. 12. Now, this is Judges 12 and 1. And the men of Ephraim, we're talking about Israelites from what tribe? Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and set on to Jephthah. Who was Jephthah? A judge, because this is the book of Judges. Wherefore passed thou over to fight against the children of Ammon and didst not call us and did not call us to go with thee. Ephraim was mad that Jephthah didn't call them to go fight. We will burn nine upon we will burn nine house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people. Why is Jephthah saying I and my people? Jephthah is a Manassite. Why is he separating himself from the Ephraimites like Naomi and Ruth did inside that book? Because they were from different tribes. During this time, you had something called tribalism. When we were showing those maps earlier, we showed Manasseh lived in what? Gilead. And below them was what? Gad. And below them was what? Reuben. We showed the maps. Showed you all the maps that's there. And what happens is he's saying, my people, the Manassites. He's using tribalism. He's separating himself because during the book of Judges, Israel was not a united monarchy. The judges ruled and judged over the people, and there were different judges in different gates. I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon, and when I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in mine hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are ye come up unto me this day to fight against me? And Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead. Remember, who was Gilead? Gilead was the Manassites. That's the land that they conquered on the maps that I brought out earlier. And fought with Ephraim. They fought together. This was a civil war. And the men of Gilead. Why is he calling them the men of Gilead? For the same reason that he called Ruth a Moabitish. Because we call people according to the lands that they live in. And it says Ephraim because they said ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. Now we see both tribes names being mentioned. But why would it call them a Gileadite? Because it's talking about the land that they live in, just like it was talking about that with Ruth. You don't know this. You've never read this. You understand what you do is you read the Talmud. That's what you read. You read Jewish sources and think that that's going to be valid. And it's never going to be valid. So four when you, four minutes, four minutes, no sweat. So now when you start reading this book, right? So now let's once again, just to go back to the book of Ruth and just to show you all of this in proper context. So now it says, now it came to pass in the days when judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Why would they go sojourn in the country of Moab? There's a famine. Why are you going to the country? You understand? Because it's a different land where there will be food during this famine. And what happens is once this woman decides to go back, as we read, she's going on to her judges, not her gods. So I see we got to run this other part back again. So I'm going to hold up. Let me stop sharing this. I'm going to slide back and I'm going to go to present share screen and we're going to go right back to the slides, right? So now remember what I said earlier, right? When we look at Mawa Abya, this is not the same as Mawa Ab. This is not the same as you understand as, as what he's trying to say. It says an inhabitant of the land of is one of the context. Why is that so important? For the same reason, remember a moment ago, 
when it talked about Gileadites and they were Manassites. Well, it just so happens down here in Reuben, when you're inside this land, when you're inside the land that's near Mount Nebo, you're inside a land that used to belong to Moab, which is why when it says Nebo, and it says a town mentioned immediately after Bethel and Ai, a Moabite town near Mount Nebo. Why? This is all in the land of Reuben. You can't get away from that. Why are you running from the geography? Why won't you admit that this did not take place below the Arnon River? That this actually took place in the land of Israel? And here's something else, too, that you need to take as a factor. Israel conquered this land, destroyed the people in that land. By the time we get to the story of Ruth during the judges, they're already living in the land of Reuben for hundreds of years. And you want to say that these are actual Moabites? Well, why would that even make sense when there's nothing but laws inside the scriptures? For example, Deuter Deuteronomy 23 and 3, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to the 10th generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. But you mean to tell me that they bringing them into the land of Israel, moving into that land? Because that doesn't make any sense because Deuteronomy 2 and 9 says what? And the Lord said unto me, distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for a possession, because I have given all unto the children of Lot to possession. This is how you know that the Bethlehemites wouldn't even travel into the actual land of Moab. But where would they travel to? They would travel to Nebo because that's their brother's land. They would go and be strangers and sojourn in their brother's land. They not going into the heathen's land. You have no idea what you're talking about. I yield the rest of my time. All right, man, let's go. Um, this is the time for the cross-examination time where you begin to ask each other questions and you have a minute to answer the question. So I'm going to set the time for a minute. You have one minute. Now, use your time wisely. And I say this because a lot of people don't understand. Like when their time is up, they say, oh, that's it. No. If it's once you answer the question and you have more that you want to say that you forgot to say or you want to add on, use that time. You got a minute. You know what I'm saying? That's like, like Hotz, I just said, I healed the rest of my time. It's cool. And Lord Abba did that too. But use that time wisely, bro. You might want to use that time to say, oh, yeah, I remember he said that and go in on that. So right now, Lord Abba, the time will start when you finish your question. All so right. So, um, I'm, I'm trying to. All right. Let me see. Let me see. Let me get to, to my questions. It's going to go back. Uh, um, Captain Kataza, you're next with your questions. All right. Um, you know, th these guys read the Bible more, more than I do, right? So they, they know it a little bit better when they're not trying to twist it up for their own narrative like this brother did here, like ISUPK does. And we have to be honest, many Hebrew Israelite camps do. So my first question is, is there anything in your Bible that specifically states that Ruth was an Israelite woman? There's no sentence that says she's an Israelite. So he still got a minute. He got a lot of time to go. He could keep it going. But um, Captain Kataza, it's your turn to ask your question. Oh, so he, it's not straight grilling. It's back and forth. Yes. Yes. Okay. Is there anything inside the Bible that says Elijah is an Israelite? I don't know. Can I expound? Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. The reason being is because it calls Elijah a Tishbite, but everybody believes Elijah to be an Israelite. You're not going to take this book that is anti-heathen and says Moabites cannot come into the congregation and then give her an entire book and then put her in a royal bloodline and connect her directly to the lineage of Christ. So once again, we call people according to the land that they live in and the context proves where she was and who she was. Okay. I got you. Okay. So, so now I like what Captain Carter's I just said, I'm going to change this to the grilling and you got five minutes, Lord Abba. To grill 
Captain Katazat, and Katazat will have the same thing. Wait, we just changing rules in the middle of this? We freestyle? Yeah, because I, like I like the back and forth. Let's keep it like that. You cool with that, Katazat? Yeah, I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool with okay. the back and forth. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with the back and forth. So, no problem. No all right, so. I tried so to make share, it better for y'all. So, go ahead. Um, I got yeah. you. I got you. Share, share my screen real quick, Sock. This is a part of my question. Okay, can you can you uh, remove that? All right. So Leviticus 24, 10 to 16, right? And we're going to start at 10, verse 10 and 11. Uh, and the son of an Israelitish woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel. And this son of the Israelitish woman and the man of Israel strolled together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And they brought him unto Moses. His mother's name was Shilomith, the daughter of the Bree of the tribe of Dan. So is this woman kind of sort of sort of an Israelite or is she an actual Israelite? It says she's an Israelitish woman, meaning what? That she's yeah, turning she's around. Israelite. You got to let him answer, Lord Abba. He, oh, okay. oh, he said what? So I, did, I thought he was asking me. My bad. OK. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm saying you want, you want me to answer? So could you could you repeat the question again just just for clarity? I don't want to muddy the waters on you. Is this woman an Israelitish woman, or meaning is she an Israelite, or is she kind of sort of like an Israelite? And if she's not kind of sort of like an Israelite, then what is she? All right, can can we pull up? Can I pull this up in the blue letter? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Let me start. Time screen. will start. Time will start when you um pull it up. Okay. Well, um, what's the what's the verse again? Uh, hold on, hold on. That verse is Leviticus 24, 10. So the, it's the first two verses, 10 and 11 of Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24 and which verse? Uh, 24 and 10, and 10, right? Yep, yep. All right, hold on. I just want to get that word. So now, when you see this word right here, right, what you're going to do is you're going to see context. And do you see what it says? A female descendant or inhabitant of the nation of Israel. When we looked at the word Moabitish, you had two words, either a citizen or you had an inhabitant of the land of. It wasn't talking about being a daughter of. This is talking about what someone inhabiting the nation of Israel. So the context is going to tell you whether somebody is of that nation directly or not. You can't use this in the same context, especially when I'm showing you the context of it pertaining directly to her living in the land and having nothing to do with ethnicity. So this is a false equivalent that you're trying to make. Oh. Okay, I mean it, it's Israelitish and it's Moabitish. Okay, and I gave hold on. It okay. is um Captain Katazar's turn to ask you a question. Okay, go ahead, Katazar. Okay, no sweat. So now in Exodus, hold on. Don't give me one second. I just want to pull this up and read it verbatim. In Exodus 22 and 28, when it says, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor cause the ruler of thy people. What is the context of revile the gods? Say, I'm sorry, say it again. In Exodus 22 and 28, when it says, Thou shalt not revile mm -hmm. the gods, nor curse the rulers of thy people. What is the context of gods right here? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Now, since he says he doesn't know, do I expound or do I yield? So, yeah, no, uh, please expound. No, I actually, I want to learn. So I want you to expound. Yeah, what, expound. what does that mean exactly? Okay, so context. Earlier, when you pulled up gods inside of Ruth, right? When you see gods, it doesn't always talk about false idols. The context is that when thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people, these gods are the rulers of your people. 
They're the Elohim, the Allahayim. They are the judges, the rulers, or the authorities that's over in that place. So the fact that you just yielded on the context of gods here, it made me a little confused as to why you were so certain about those gods inside the book of Ruth earlier when you didn't even know the context here. All right, Lord Abba, it's your turn. Question. Um, okay, I, I, I don't know what where he went with that. Again, this is merely his interpretation and the interpretations of his camp, but you will find that sourced in no authority at all outside of his camp and maybe a, a few other Hebrew Israel, Israelite camps that come from out of that one West school. So I do have a question. If, if, if the Israelites took the land of Moab, why didn't they simply call that land Israel, right? Because when the Europeans come over here, for instance, and they start to colonize this land, they start to take over. The, the name, the original names of the land get, you know, they, we don't know them anymore. We just know them as the United States of America. We know Georgia after King George. We know the Carolinas after, uh, what is it, Queen Caroline, I believe it is. Why didn't the Moabites, excuse me, why didn't the Israelites simply annex Moab and call it by the name Israel? Just, just one big Israel, the same way the Europeans did the United States. I got you. That that's a good question because this that's two different completely cultures of people. The the way that you understand Europeans colonize is not the same way any other nation colonizes. I'll give you a, a recent example. China is colonizing areas in Africa, buying fishing rights and uh, uh, seaports all throughout the world without firing a single bullet. It just so happens that this is the oppressor in the earth and they erase people's cultures completely, you understand, out the frame. Now, I gave an example earlier that we do things like that today where you had them trying to rename Harlem to Soha, but we still call it Harlem. You have an area in New York called Clinton now, but we still call it Hell's Kitchen. When you read inside the Bible from our cultural lens, you had times where it's called the land of Canaan and times where it's called the land of Israel. We kept those names and those areas that we learned that they were, and those became the demographics that we would relate to. So could they have a right to rename areas? Yes, they do. Do they also have a right to use them as the same? Yes, they do. And that's exactly what they did. And that's exactly what I show and proved. All right. Okay. You're trying to ask your question, Captain. But can I just real quick? Well, you, 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 could, you, could, you could let him expand and then I'll ask a question. So, because, now, the, reason I wanted, the reason why I asked that question was because of the breakdown that he gave where he said he showed and proved, but he didn't show and prove. Right, because this region was still Moab, and his Bible still says that Ruth and Orpah were Moabite women, like the, the, the Moabitish women, meaning that she belongs to the nation of the Moabites. I mean, this is this is simple. I, I don't know the Bible like y'all do. Y'all 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 got me on that. But common sense and, and simplicity is my specialty. But yeah, go ahead. Ask your, ask your next question. I'm I'm, I'm ready. So now in in the the book of Ruth, right? Mm -hmm. So when we read inside of Ruth the third chapter, um, you know what I'm saying? Th there's a law called the law of kinsmen, and the law of kinsmen, kin is literally your family. Boaz was a man that was so righteous that in Ruth three and twelve he said, "And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. How be it there is a kinsman nearer than I." So he turns around and says, tarry this night and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto you the part of kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part, but he will not do the kinsman part onto thee. Then I will do the kinsman to thee as the Lord liveth lie down onto the morning. It's a sin to sleep with a woman who's of another race. Why would this brother be so zealous to keep the law of kinsmen, but not? to not sleep with a heathen. Ah, uh, how y'all say it? You, you cut yourself? Let me start from the, <laughs> from the same chapter. Oh man, this is too easy. And it came to pass, this is starting from verse eight. And it came to pass at midnight that a man was afraid and he turned himself and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, Ruth, thine handmaid. 
spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. Meaning you're not a kinsman, but because I'm here, you cut yourself, you cut yourself. But because I am here and I have been accepted into your tribe, into your people, I am a near kinsman. And he said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast shewed me kindness in the latter end then at the beginning. Inasmuch as thou followest, not young men, whether poor or rich. Let's go to the verse he cited, 11. And now my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth not know that thou art a virtuous woman because they don't know her. She's a foreigner there. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. How be it there is a kinsman nearer than I? He's basically saying you are, you have been accepted as a part of our people. And I'm rocking with you 100%. It's like that dude you grew up with or that, that female. Y'all not really cousins, but y'all so close. Y'all not blood cousins, but y'all be like, yo, y'all my cousin. There's people I still call my cousins until this day. You shouldn't have brought that one up. You cut yourself. Next question. Oh, it's okay. my turn. It's I'm, your turn, I'm, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Go ahead, my bad. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just show you on the tail end that you have no idea what it, the law of kinsmen is, and you didn't answer my question. But I understand where your confusion's coming in. You got it. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, I, I can be confused, but the the text is very clear, and I can read. <laughs> Near time. kinsmen. So, um, I, I, I'm, I really don't have. Any more questions? Um, you know, I think this is, we, you know, I think we asked three questions a piece already. It's been a good, good volley thus far. Um, I don't know if we're going to do some more presentations. Yeah, you or... got one more left. Do you have a question or no? No, no, I, I'm good. Right. I, I don't yeah, have any more questions. That. You got one last question or no? If not, okay, so the third. No, right. I, 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 I do have a question for Go you. Ahead. Go ahead. What, what and where? Uh, um, if any, are you understand one of the laws of kinsmen, my brother? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But I know that the text is clear when it says you are a near kinsman, meaning you are not my kinsman, but you're like my kinsman because you're here and I rock with you. That's easy to read. You can explain the law of kinsmen if you want to. I'm, I'm good. I'm a, I'm, I'm a student. I'm a student. Okay. Right. Okay. I, go ahead, go ahead. I, pre I, I appreciate you, brother. Right. So when you have a law of kinsmen, the law of kinsmen, when he's saying that there's a kinsman closer than I, when it's talking about the law of kinsmen, what's ha OK, what's happening is I'm going to try to explain this as, as simple as possible. OK, so all right, I'm going to just read numbers 27 to start and I'm going to try to be as simple as possible. This is numbers mm -hmm. 27 and seven. It said the daughters of Zelophad speak right. Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren, and thou shalt cause an inheritance of their father to pass to them. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass on to his daughter. And if he have no daughter, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his brethren. And if he have no brethren, ye shall give his inheritance unto his father's brethren. And if his father have no brethren, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his kinsmen that's next to him in the family you related it to ruth because you're trying to say we're bringing ruth into the family that's not what he was saying he's saying there's someone closer to me to you who could marry you before me that's closer in blood than i am and he's saying if he won't marry you i will because that's how the inheritance works it's about who's the closest to you in your blood it wasn't talking about ruth's blood it was talking about his and and brother that's why i don't think that you're qualified because you don't even know the laws of inheritance in israel because that's the story of ruth it's about inheritance okay i got you all right i don't no, know yeah, you're right i see you Tazaria. All right. All I know right. more than you think. That's they all focus, I'm going to say. They focus, Lord Abba. I'm, oh, I'm focused. Let's I have focus. to let you know, Captain Cartazar is leading in the polls, 52 to 48. This of is course. your last and final round. Maybe you can make up some ground. In <sighs> this. So bring it home. It's on you. You got 10 minutes in this I round. Mean, all right. I mean, I've already proven what I've what I've needed to prove. Uh, let me see. 
see. Where, where do I want to go with this, man? Maybe where, you can. Where, where do I want to go? And show the people. Okay, this Something this is what I'll go. do. I'll, I'll start. Come on, let's start from here. All I'll, right. I'll just get back to teaching. Did I? Is it up, sir? No. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. My bad. You're not sharing nothing yet. My bad, my bad. I'll just get back to teaching. This, this is all right. I see it. I see this it. This is there easy work. This is easy work. Easy work. All right. So let's let, let's 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 this up. All right. Let's get into this. This is from my paper. Moors, Moabites, and Berbers are these names and people historically synonymous? Analyzing historical, biblical, and archaeological correlations. As you can see, my paper is in the top two percent of all read papers on the whole of academia.edu. And I'm no biblical scholar. I'm no scholar. I'm just a dude from the streets of Far Rockaway, Queens, Hamels Project. Shout out to my hood. But I but I know a little bit. And I always give honors to Prophet Noble Drew Ali for putting me on this path and the political path. And so the reason why I want to bring my paper up is because he kept citing the boundaries of Moab. And this is what I write in my paper. As per the biblical narrative, narrative moab is not an archaeological culture see they put that name those names on the map they're guessing where moab is there's no definitive uh place in in according to the biblical scholars of where moab is it's just guesswork so let me start over as per the biblical narrative moab is not an archaeological culture that has an historic beginning or continuity Instead, to explain this early great civilization's coming into fruition by way of migration, usurpation, and conquer, or some other means by which nations form themselves geographically, Moab comes into existence by some concocted story set to show the shameful origins of this nation. This account must be read with the racial and nationalistic undertones that is ever present in the biblical narrative of a quote-unquote chosen people. Jacob and his mother Rachel tricking Esau slash Edom to steal his birthright, to Sarah's expulsion of Hagar and Ishmael into the desert, essentially placing them outside of the lineal boundaries of Abraham, to Tamar dressing up as a prostitute to trick the king of Judah into giving her the scepter and instruments of rule. These must all be examined in the context of the Moab narrative as they are vitally important to understand it and the undertones by which it has been concocted. So let's get back into this man right here, Nobu Drew Ali. He's the reason why I know all of this stuff. So I got to I gotta shout him out. This is the convention picture, October of 1928. There's an arrow pointed to a woman next to him, to his right. And as you can see, she has an apron on. What most don't know is what is inscribed upon that apron along with the sketch of a lamb. And this is what it reads. It reads, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, which is why he you know, took the picture with all the people gathered, get it? And we know that Shiloh is merely an epithet for a Messiah. Now I bring that up because I want to show the historical context outside of the biblical narrative. I believe that the biblical like places and certain names, even certain individuals are in fact historic, but the biblical codex writers took these things and remixed them. And one of the things that Noble Drew Ali did was he came to put them uh, to show us I should say, how to put them back in place, or at least show me the Moors are still following behind old haters like Sharif Bey. They ain't getting nothing done scholastic-wise. I'm just keeping it official. So let's go into Chemosh, because I got to show Judah, Arab, R, all of these things are connected. Chemosh, they give him this name, Subdua. But in any of the exegetical texts, it says that Chemosh is possibly a rendition of the Sumerian or Babylonian name Shamash, which makes sense, which means the sun. The national god of the Moabites, who were called the people of Chemosh, also of the Ammonites, though Moloch was afterwards their god. Moloch and Chemosh may mean the same god, 
who might have been also called Baal Peor. Traces of the same worship are found at Babylon, Tyre, and it was introduced among the Hebrews by Solomon, who built the high place on the Mount of Offense, so named for that act. One day, Sa, I want to come on and I want to break all of this stuff down. And when I do, every Hebrew Israelite is going to have to question their understanding. But what I have underlined is of importance here. The Arabs worshiped a black stone as his emblem, as a black stone in the Kaaba at Mecca is an emblem now worshiped by all Mohammedans. This idol represented some of the planets, perhaps Saturn. We know the rumor is that uh, the black stone, as it's called, it's brown, and the Kaaba is actually a meteorite. Some people uh, believe, some scholars believe, archaeologists believe that the black stone that was worshipped by the Moabites too was a piece of rock from, from outer space. So here I want to bring you to the word R. Oh, remember, I'm in teaching mode right now. The debate been over when I read the book of Ruth and then when I read it again. So R is the capital of Moab on the Arnod, which he keeps harping on, right? The place is still called Rabba. But I, in the, the name of it in, in the book also in Isaiah 15 uh, verse 1 is Rabbath Moab. Again, I do not have time to break all of these things down. He mentioned King Sihon. I know about all of that because I have it in my paper. But I want you to look at that, the accents over the A. Those accents, those diacritics, and I can't remember the exact name, is it gives it the pronunciation of ear. So it's not actually R. And we can deduce that it is the same thing with Ara or Eri or Ari, which means lion, which is also another epithet of who? Judah. We look down at the bottom definition and we see what? Arab literally being called by the name Judah in their Bible in Joshua 15, 52. I have it up on the screen. I don't have time to give it, get into the breakdowns. Beth Araba, house of the desert, one of the six cities of Judah. Remember, I started this thing off with Nobu Ali talking about that sector of Judah. These people, the people of Judah, the people of Moab, they are the people, the true people of Israel, the, the people that come in before they the Yahweh's take it over and call it Israel. They are all one people. And we find this in this name, R, right? And we look at one of the firstborn sons of Judah, Judah Ur. We see that same accent over the ER. And it <clears throat> says what? Watchful. Did you say my time, sir? No, sir. Continue. Oh, my bad. I thought I heard something. So let me read this. The firstborn of Judah, son of Bathsheba. That name Shua is important. And when I come on and give my breakdown one of these days, y'all gonna see what I mean. A Canaanite, he married Tamar, who became mother of Perez and Zara by Judah. He probably sinned by idolatry, right? This like this, they made this stuff up. They took these actual people and they twisted up these narratives. In the line of Judah, of Shelah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why did I pull this up? Because I wanted to show the connection to the other aspect, which Two I minutes. showed when I read, how many minutes? Two minutes. From, from Mustafa uh, Gadala, where he showed that there was a connection between Egypt and Moab, right? And when we look at the hieroglyph for Osiris, we see that Osiris is pronounced in two ways. Well, Seir and Osar, smash, and I know all of y'all Egyptological folks, Reggie, I know you watching if I'm wrong, put it in the chat and say that I'm wrong. Two ways to pronounce Osiris's name, Wasir and Osar. That ear or R sound is the same exact as the I in the glyph of Osiris, who according to some uh, scholars is a Berber god that was borrowed by the ancient Egyptians. The Berbers are the Moors. These are the same people of Moab. So when we see Ur watchful and then we see that I, again, I'm just teaching right now because I'm trying to meld some things together with, you know, with, with my people out there because we need to bring all of these different things together. Judah, this is Genesis 38, 3, 6. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn. 
and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death. See, it wasn't wickedness what what Ruth, what uh, Lot's daughters did by tricking um, Lot to get drunk and then date rape him. No, that wasn't wickedness. They never tell you what Ur did. This is a way to get Ur, R, Moab out of the picture so that they can usurp the line. I hope I'm making sense to the sensible people that understand what I'm saying here. Again, when time permits, I will come on one day and give a full breakdown. Aram, son of Shem, Shem, Shemetic, Semitic, Aram, Aramaic, all of these ARs connect to uh, Arab or Arabia, et cetera, et cetera. If, ah, I wanted to read this last source. Oh, I wanted to read this last source. Give me two, give me one more minute, sir. Go ahead, read the last source. All right, let me read this last source, y'all. Okay, this is from Nature Knows No Color Line. Research into the Negro ancestry and the white race. This was the third edition that was published in 1952, page 57. It reads, many American Negroes are indistinguishable from Arabs. The New York Times, February 2nd, 1945, reports of the meeting between President Roosevelt and King Ibn Saud. This is in J.A. Rogers' book, Sa. Quote, it was a matter of considerable astonishment of the king's servants to discover American Negro cooks and mess boys. You know how they, how they did us back in the days. They tried to keep us in that servant role. And it was more than difficult to persuade them that these were not also Arabs. The matter was never entirely cleared up. So we have in this country proof that when the King of Arabia came and visited the White House, he and his staff said, what are these Arabians doing washing your dishes and being servants for you? These are your sources right here, family. You have to look them up for yourself. I just came to do this last verse to teach, man, because this debate been over. Peace. This is just a fact. All right. Um, being that I gave you an extra minute, it's only right sure. that I give Captain Katazat um, 11 minutes, which is an extra minute to make it 11. So, Captain Katazat, your time starts when you are ready, brother. This uh, is the last and final round. All right, hold on. Let me just... And then we get to question and answers, brothers and sisters that's out there. If you want to ask a question, it is time for you to get your question ready. Step up, not to come on to give a presentation. It is simply to ask a question. So I'm going to drop that link for that as um Captain Cotton's out. Get ready. All right, I'm, I'm good to go, sir. I see, I see your, your screen. All right. Uh, I, I appreciate the horn, Sai, because I, I fell asleep on that last round. I appreciate the alarm clock. Like, I, I don't I don't know. Like, I don't know. Once again, I don't know who or what topic you came to debate, but you spent your first and your third round debating something that has absolutely nothing to do with the topic. Like, I don't know if you ill prepared. And I, I just want you all to pay attention. He spoke with so much conviction earlier. He was fired up. And you understand? And a couple of ad homs here and there. It's cool. I, I shot some back. You know what I'm saying? It's all love at the end of the day. But what I want you to know is that he's so adamant about saying, yes, because the God's here. And then when I ask him, what does God's mean in this context? I don't know, brother. And you know what? It's right for you to say you don't know. Then when I ask you about where can you show me the law of kinsmen, because you used to be a more, I thought y'all loved the law, but not the laws of the Bible. You want to speak philosophy of the Bible, but you don't want to talk about the practicality of the law of the Bible. No, no, no. God forbid. Right. So why then, if I asked you two simple questions that have everything to do with the book of Ruth and you spoke so adamantly earlier, should I believe anything else that you said as authority? When all I have to do is put you on a brief hot seat and you fold. That doesn't make any sense, brother, because now, like if I was in the listening audience, I would say, well, you know, he was reading some stuff earlier, but maybe he doesn't understand what he's saying. Why, why should I even believe this man? Because here's what's even crazier. I ain't never seen nobody in my life pull out a source that they wrote. Like it's an ancient document and we should be listening to it. That's your opinion. That paper is your opinion. That's not a primary. 
Garfield would call that pseudo, brother. I don't I don't know if you know that, but since you were talking about t- teaching, let me teach you about the things you don't know about Ruth because you didn't bring up you understand any of the geography. You understand? You said you knew about King Sihon and all that, but you know, you, I could say I know about anything. You didn't teach it. I taught it. I showed it to you. I researched it. I presented the information. You gave me lip service. So now let's Let's talk about the law of redemption. Let's talk about what happened in Ruth. When we read Leviticus, the 25th chapter and the the 23rd verse, it says the land shall not be sold forever, meaning the land of Israel cannot be sold onto another nation and your inheritance cannot be sold. Why? For the land is mine. For ye, speaking to the Israelites, are strangers and sojourners with me. Just like Ruth was called the stranger. Because all of Israel is strangers and sojourners with the Lord. That's why we wandered through the desert. We wouldn't have land if he didn't give us our inheritance. So he's giving us the laws on what to do with our inheritance. And in all the land of your possession, ye shall grow a redemption for the land. The story of Ruth is about redemption of land. See, here's what happened. Elimelech dies. He passes away. So now you have his wife, Naomi. Her sons pass and they have no one because Ruth is not his daughter. It's daughter-in-law. And this woman is not his daughter. It's his wife. The children are the inheritors, which is why they need someone who's their kin who can redeem the land. So what happens is when we're reading about him saying, I'm the nearest of kin, the first thing that you need to know is that Elimelech fell into decay. You couldn't sell your land, but you could lease your land in the sense of verse 25. It says, if thy brother be waxen poor, during that famine, Elimelech was waxen poor in the book of Ruth and had sold away some of his possession, meaning what? He sold away the profits of his land, the agriculture and the fruits and the vegetables that the land would yield for profit. And if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. But remember what we read earlier. He didn't have sons. He didn't have daughters. So now we have to look to his brothers. The brothers weren't there. Now we have to look at who's the nearest of his kin. At any time, they could come to redeem it. When we, What we read inside the book of Ruth was that the other brothers who were of kin, let's get it right now, matter of fact. Let's go to the book of Ruth and the fourth chapter. You understand? And it says, then Boaz, this is Ruth 4 and 1, and then Boaz went up to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsmen of whom Boaz spake came by. He wasn't talking about Ruth in that capacity. He was talking about who he was related to because this was about Naomi's kinsmen. It was about who Elimelech was related to because you weren't allowed to oppress your brothers. You weren't allowed to give the land away to someone else. Never mind another nation. And it says, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake by unto him said, oh, such a one turn aside, sit down here and turn aside. And he sat down and took 10 men of the elders of the city and sit ye down here. And they sat down. They're now having a council. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi has come again out of the country of Moab. Where is this country of Moab? I showed you it's above that Arnon River you're talking about. It was in the land of Reuben selling a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. So now because they're in debt for you to redeem the land, you have to pay the debt off the land. Boaz had money. So what he did was he paid that money to redeem that land. And that now when he puts a child inside Ruth, that child is going to become the inheritor of that land through Elimelech's name and lineage because that's what happens when your brother passed. You brought up, um, like you bring up so many asinine points. Like I'm listening to that last round. You quoting yourself. You bringing up things that have nothing to do with the debate. You saying, I read it in the book of Ruth. You didn't even understand half of what you read in Ruth. I ask you two simple questions. I don't know. It's good not to know. Well, if you don't know, don't teach it. Stick to what you know then. I don't know soccer. I don't talk soccer. If someone speaks soccer, I'm going to shut my mouth and listen. And that's what you should do when it comes to the Bible. You should stay a student. You shouldn't teach. So when we're reading this, this is all about the law. And that's why I asked you, I said, if this brother would turn around and he would keep this law, which is a small law in comparison to sleeping with a heathen, 
why then would he now commit such an atrocity of laying with a heathen? He wouldn't because this was a zealous man. This was a man who kept the law. And that's why he redeemed it and passed that inheritance on. And that's why this is a famous story inside the Bible. But you don't know that. You understand? At this point, if I continue, it'll it'll literally just be redundant. I just wanted to clarify that he does not know the law of kinsmen, didn't even know the context of God's Elohim, Allahim. You understand? In any way, shape, form, or capacity, he yielded. Like Kevin Zoyak said, he gave up the ghost. This brother was through. So you know what he said? He said, I'm going to go back and stick with what I'm comfortable. He said, these brothers know the Bible better than me. So let me come over here and read you something I wrote from my own understanding. That's crazy, bro. If, if, you, if anybody else would have did that, y'all would have laughed them off stage. That's pathetic. I yield. Oh, man, and that wasn't even the closing. God damn. <laughs> that wasn't even the closing. Oh, See, I've always known being that Katazat, this is first time over here on the debate. He was always built for this. Uh, General Rihanna builds men over there and they build them ready for war. So Lord Abba, I always say to everybody, be careful what you ask for because you might get it. And that's for exactly. both of us. And so now here we at, here we go. We at the question and answer period before y'all get y'all closing round. Come on in and ask your questions. No, no, um, teaching. Just ask a question. Peace and blessings to you, my brother. What's happening? Yo, it's a good debate. I gotta rewatch that uh that third round from Lord Abba for sure. That was I feel like that went over a lot of people's heads, you know. But all right, ask your question, brother. All right, all right, for come sure. on, let him give me my props, Sal. Let him because you know all these Hebrews about to come up here and give, and give cotton's out. His give let me let me get some props. All right, no <laughs> doubt. Give him his props. Go ahead. <laughs> no, nah, go ahead, brother. I really, yo, I, I feel like Abba kind of, he od with the towel when he was like, yo, y'all know the Bible, this, that, and the third, but whatever. I want this question to go for both of y'all. Hopefully Abba could, you know what I'm saying, give some insight on this question as well, but Katazah, if Abba is wrong in his assessment where a near kinsman is someone who is not of Israel, right? What would you say about First Chronicles 2 and 34 to where a Judite man gave his daughter to his Egyptian servant, right? Because either, either this was something that this Judite man was doing wrong, he was going off, or he was within the confines of the law by giving his daughter to his Egyptian servant making this Egyptian servant his near kin. All right, question, brother. Question, brother. You got a question? Oh, that's it. Oh, Captain Katazai, did you understand the question? You want me to repeat it? Captain, you there? Hold up. Look like he kind of looked like right, he glitched. Back in. Uh, let me say this too on the on Lord Abba behalf, being that I, I said something on that. Let me keep it fair. I want to say, Lord Abba, um, Captain Katazat did three rounds to your two rounds because you choked in the third round. And I'm saying that to say this listen to me, good y'all. Yeah, remember, yeah. Loaded Lux battled Calico, Loaded Lux choked in his first round. Which gave Loaded Lux two rounds to three. And Loaded Lux came out still the winner. So even if you did two rounds, it's up to the people. You can still win. So he got him on the edge point, sir. Huh? He one, got him on the edge point. He I got him on that. Understand that right there. And the people he got him that, on the edge. Hold on, brother. I'm talking. The people that saw that, y'all know what I'm talking about. Go and check out the Loaded Lux battle with Calico and Loaded Lux choked in his first round. So it was only two rounds to Calico three, and Lotus still smoked him with the last two rounds, killed him. So uh, we got to wait to Captain Contest. I get back in the building. <clears throat> uh, you know, I'm, I'm so let me let me if I can. Yes, go ahead. So you know, on my third round, I don't feel that I choked at all. 
I feel that I proved my point and I used my extra time to educate the people because I want us to. The reason that you choked in your third round because you didn't talk about Ruth in your third round. You went off somewhere else. But if you think about choking, you you talked about a whole different topic. not, Not really, because I talked about the geography of Moab. Right, and then I tied it to the people, and and I I made it an extension to where we are today. Like I, I could get so much deep, I don't have the, the time. Hey, I'm back. You can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I don't have the time to go in the way that I want to. I want the brother you, to ask the question, but I yeah. definitely didn't do that. All right, hold I on. Proved, ask your question. Ask your question. Hold on, hold on. So let me let me finish with this. I proved I heard the question I came to prove that Ruth was in fact the Moabite. I just took the extra time to teach. Okay. All. all right, Captain. My bag a little bit. You heard the question, Captain. So, so back back to uh, to what the uh, what the brothers twelve, and now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit, there is a kinsman nearer than I. What you're talking about, brother, is not according to this law that we're speaking about transpiring in Ruth. We're talking about inheritance of this direct land and a direct law that they're following. And I read one of the laws when it comes down to inheritance that passed down. So contextually, what you're saying does not line up with the book of Ruth and doesn't line up with the law that we're speaking about as to this near of kinsman law. Well, it would make it lawful if that brother, the Judite brother in First Chronicles 2.34, either it's lawful or it's unlawful. For him to give his Judite daughter to an Egyptian. So it, it does make sense that this Egyptian man that is his servant would be a near kinsman, just as Ruth the Moabitess was. No. So that's why and, I'm saying I'm asking you, was and, it unlawful or and, was it lawful? Okay, that's that a complete he gave this what he gave his daughter to the his Egyptian servant. What I'm saying is, first of all, the second half, you're moving the goalpost. I'm trying to clear up your confusion. What you, you turned around and said, when nah, Lord nah, Abba, you, 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 me, you want me to answer the question or are you going to get emotional? Let, which one is it? Go ahead, Captain. I, I'm I, emotional, but you're not answering I, the question. I mean, you, you, sound, you sound emotional because you're asking the question from a false premise. So, like, I'm trying to clear up your confusion. No, I'm asking you if that if that was lawful. Or if it That's was not what you asked me initially. What you asked me initially was based. That's- what you asked me initially was based off the premise when you said, "How is it that what Abba said earlier was blah 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 blah?" You understand? You turn around saying this when that's not what happened. Maybe you didn't understand I what I was explaining when it comes down to the kinsman. You're trying. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay. you, you done yet? No, I'm listening. Like, 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 brother, like I sat here, I I listened to your question, but I finished without interruption or not. I'm listening, brother. Okay, so then stop speaking. That's how you listen. You don't listen by speaking. Yo, I, I sat back for like you're five, still talking. Ten seconds. Like you, you still talking. You got to let the captain finish answering the question, brother. And then maybe you can come back with another question. Go ahead, Cap. Go ahead, Cap. So, so now with what we're saying earlier. What I explained was he was confused when he's trying to make Ruth the near kinsman he's looking for. The near kinsman he was looking for wasn't Ruth. He found him in Ruth the fourth chapter, which is how you know that what you're trying to equate it to is not the same. I'll read it again inside Ruth the fourth chapter to show you that what you're talking about has you're you're asking two questions, basically. So now I'm going to read this right here in Ruth four. It says that four and one, then went Boaz to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by. If what you're saying is true, trying to compare the Egyptian situation to this one, why did they go find this man? If Ruth is the kinsman, they had the kinsman. It wasn't talking about that. It was talking about who was more closely related with Elimelech and Naomi. It had nothing to do with Ruth in that situation. It had to do with Elimelech's brother, which is why in verse three, it said, and he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth the parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. The kinsman is Elimelech. 
Meaning, who's the nearest kinsman to Elimelech? We know it's not Ruth. And it's not Boaz. There's somebody in between Boaz. They went and found him and he denies it. So Boaz steps in. And that's why I'm saying you can't compare those two scriptures. And that's why I was trying to correct you before we went any further because you didn't know what you were talking about. Okay, but brother, I'm asking you about First Chronicles 2.34. Would that Egyptian servant be considered a near kinsman? That's, that was my question. Okay. When just to clarify, right, and I'm going to answer your question directly, you were basing it off of saying if Abba was wrong earlier. So I had to first clarify your misunderstanding. So, no, according to this context, that near kinsman is not applying because it's a completely separate law we would be talking about. And that's what I'm explaining to you. That's why I'm telling you it's a false equivalent. I can't explain it any clearer than that. All right, uh, moving right along. Let's get over there to my brother, Shake Roy Lee Bay. Shake Roy Lee Bay. What up, Roy? How you, man? Peace. Islam, brother. I'm mute. Come on, let's go. There's a lot of talk about the word ish earlier in the conversation. And I would like to ask uh, the brother, Captain, are you familiar with the term, or should I say the word, Polysemia or double entendre. Are you familiar with those words, brother? I'm familiar with the word double entendre. I'm, you know, what I'm saying, I, 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 uh, I, I study rap, bro. <laughs> Give me your understanding on that, right quick, brother. Double entendre is when you're talking about two things at the same time that are of or related you understand one of my favorite bars was when jay-z said triple entendre don't even ask me how con edison flow i'm connected to a high power you know what i'm saying um well hip-hop is not really always definitive when it comes to definitions because it's word playing that but let me go right to the source double entendre is a word that carries two different meanings so, um, so a word that has describing two things, but those two things have uh, uh, two different or similar meanings. Polysemia is also another term that also means and denotes one word that has the same meaning twice. So when you talk about the word ish in regard to this matter, the word polysemia also denotes in relation to country, to land, culture, and characteristics. Now, how would you tie that word or those terms into the relation of Ruth? I can't recall what you said earlier with regard to the whole something about Ruth being a modal bias or something like that. I didn't think personally that really excluded the fact of what Lord Ivor was saying based on these other two words that are not really in common usage today. So being that we know words can carry meant more than one meaning, that's what I'm saying, in other words, you didn't really express that part. So now that I'm presenting that to you, let's go with the term polysemia. Would you say now that the word polysemia in relation to Ruth being a little, Ruth being a Moabitess, does that also allude that because there's words that carry more than one meaning, could she still be that Moabitess? That's what I'm asking you you making this complicated for nothing and i guess maybe you wasn't paying attention to what i'm what i was saying earlier right so i said that the word had more than one definition i pulled the word up on the screen and i said we, the context of this word is based on b the second definition which means to be an inhabitant of the land of and then I then proceeded to show you biblically the descriptions of where this land was located. And then I showed about 13 maps, which all show where it was located. So this is not a double entendre. This is not polysime. This is context of the word in definition. And I showed using geography and the biblical descriptions of the area, which definition we would have to insert contextually based off of what we were reading. Um, with, with all we know today that maps have also, I'm not saying that the map you show was, 
but we know maps have been manipulated in history by a great many of cartographers who structurally drew up these maps, like Case in Point. The maps today are flipped upside down. All right, all right. Hey, hold on, hold on, brother. Um, if you can't prove the statement right now, then that right there is yeah, yeah, that, that's that's what I was gonna say, Sal. Like now we're talking conspiracy. What you would have to do is you would have to show me the map being yeah. altered, and then you would have to and I've showed right. several maps throughout different uh, you understand throughout different years, different generations, different time periods. So I mean, that's hey, it's irrelevant. I'm only doing that, Roy Bay, because I got to get ready to roll. But anyway, um, thank you, my brother. I appreciate you. Um, your mic yeah. is off, Roy Bay. Thank you, brother. Um, Captain Kantazat, can you please um, which location or country is uh, more bites today? It's uh, you're saying it says, please ask Captain Kataza which location or country is Moabite today. I, that right. doesn't make sense to me. Moabites are the actual descendants, but the land we were talking about was the east Moabite of the Jordan thing. River, right. next to that, next to the um, uh, what do you call it, where Mount Nebo was. So it would still today be at that region that's right by the Dead Sea and right by the uh, uh, east of the Jordan River. It would be in the same location. You know, if go Google where the Jordan River is and you'll see the exact location. All right, there you go. All right, Miss Shaddai is in the building. Peace and blessings, what's going on? Yeah, peace, Son Editor. Thank you for letting me come in to ask a question. Peace to the panel, Lord Abba, uh, Captain Kataza, Kataza and the audience. Um. This is a great uh, debate. I just wanted to ask some questions um, to Captain Kataza, if you don't mind, Captain Kataza. Is that okay? You said what now? I'd like to ask you a couple of quick questions. A couple? I got, yeah, just, I got just time for, for like one. About like, what's up? One? You have time for one? Yeah, because they thought, got, no, I got yeah, it. I thought we were okay, running well, through. Let, me, let me pose the question this. Let me just put it all together. Mm. Um, if there's no disagreement for everybody who knows the Bible, um, handmaids are typically surrogates. We have Hagar as a handmaid. We have um, the handmaids of Rachel and, Lo and Leah. And so in the story of Ruth and Naomi, can you tell us why Naomi takes the child over and Ruth does not raise the child? And typically handmaids are foreigners. If no one disputes that, I just want to hear your explanation that points to her being a heathen because she hands her child over to Naomi. And even in the scripture, it says there is a son born to Naomi. It doesn't say anything about Ruth in the in the story. Why is it that in the story, it, it, it appears that Ruth is an actual surrogate handmaid and not actually an Israelite mother. Okay, you're inserting um, surrogate and you're inserting all of these things. So now this is why, because I explained earlier, I don't, I don't know if you were paying attention. I don't know if there's some kind of cognitive dissidence. One, the, even the way you portray it, first of all, Naomi is that child's grandmother. And the reason as to why it's talking about a child being born onto Naomi is because this wasn't about Ruth inheriting. It wasn't even about Naomi inheriting. It was about Elimelech's lineage being able to have an inheritance. So that's why I'll read this again. Ruth, the fourth chapter and the third verse. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab. It's talking about this, these kinsmen here, you understand, sell it the parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's, because the point was Ruth couldn't inherit the land because she wasn't their direct daughter. She's daughter in law. They didn't have any sons to pass it on to by this child being born in the law of kinsmen. Like when you read in Deuteronomy, when it talks about, and if thy brother dies without seed, a near of kinsmen shall go in and put seed onto him. So Naomi has, you understand, the closest when it comes down to, to who that land would belong to until the heir is born. Now that the heir is born, this child is going to inherit her husband's estate. Okay. And that's what that's what the kinsman is about. Thank you. And I was listening. And it was a great debate. I do want to add that handmaid in Hebrew is Shifra. And it, I believe it's Shifra or Shifra. 
that means slave and ama also is handmade. Those both mean slave girl. So if you say so, you know, I'm not doing the debate you are, but it, she is being referred to as a slave girl, not an Israelite virgin or an Israelite maid. But like I said, it's not my debate. Thank you so much for that answer. And um, Lord Abba, great debate. And you, that's all. Thank you. Peace. Okay, so Thanks, just, if I, if I could respond to something, sir. Uh, um, did you want to respond to that? Um, I'm going to respond regardless, and then we're going to move on. But um, okay. when, when you turn around, right, and I'm going to, let me see something here. Let me find the exact verse. Um, While you're doing that, thank you, Nepal, because you just taught me something extra. Uh, you know, I, I get to shake the rust off and get back into this thing. I just knew that these guys could never prove that Ruth was an Israelite. So, oh, I think we already you did that. You, you held this L tonight. Even the court of public opinion says that. Oh, you right. must not be looking yeah, at the chat. On. That was your people saying that. Come on, because I got to close this thing out, y'all. That's your people saying that. Right. Would if you say you check so? the blue letter, if you check the blue letter, excuse me, I'm sorry, Captain Katja. If you check the blue mm -hmm. letter, you can see handmade typically means slave or it does, and it does mean surrogate if you do the research. Okay, uh, that, had, that's a what what oh uh, you see now you're gonna pull me into I'm this sorry, whole go thing. Ahead, brother. I'm sorry, we'd have to we'd have to get the exact context to look at, it, and I guarantee you that it's not gonna line up in that capacity. And remember, they were poor. They had to be redeemed. An Israelite could sell themselves as far as their services if they were wax and poor. That's all throughout Leviticus, the 25th chapter. But Sa's mm -hmm. saying he got to move on. So, I mean, no, you're right about that. I will say he's this. right. You could have a I, father. I know I'm right. Of, well, no, let me clarify it a little bit for you because um, yeah, since you said I have it. cognitive dissonance. All right. Hey, hey, me, hold on. I just want to, I'm going to finish it up. I'm just finishing up. This is great for everybody who's learning. They can study. It actually says, about a daughter that a father can sell his daughter or have his daughter go be a slave. Typically in the law, it doesn't. And in the context of that story, we know there's no father. And we know that in the story, it says that they came into the land and Naomi thought that she had no kinsmen anymore. Then she found out that she had kinsmen. So she wanted to marry her off to him. But regardless, Thank you, you guys. All right, so now, now, now I have to read hey, this. Hey, no, no, come on, cut this out, because see, it ain't about. Oh, okay. I, I understand. I understand. You're going to have the respect of persons with your co-host. No, no, let him I got respond, you. Please. No, I'll, no, I'll I got you. Jump off. I'll no, hold off, on. Captain. There's I'll something I got to take care of. That's please, why Captain. it just came up at the, in, you know, last minute. So, mm -hmm. uh, Lord Apple, I'm going to give you three minutes to close this thing out. You're closing, and then I'm going to give Captain Katza three minutes to close out. Let's go. Okay, definitely, man. Thank you, Sarnetta. And, and shout out to Captain Katazar. We had a good, good debate, unlike my last debate, which was childish and a bunch of nonsensical cartoons and other nonsense. This was actually good. I think the audience enjoyed it. Uh, but I proved that Ruth was a Moabite using y'all's own book. That was the easiest part of this debate. Everything else, somebody said in the chat, I should have used the biblical scholars. Yeah, I could have. I pulled up a bunch of them, but who wants to hear me repeat the same thing for 45 minutes? Nobody. So what I did was I proved that Ruth was a Moabitess using their Bible. And then I simply gave some historical context because it's something that I believe that people need to know and that Ruth is. I know she may be a fictitious character, right? To, some people may call her fictitious, but whatever she represents, represents our bloodline. And we have to understand that. That's why I show what I show tonight. The biblical codex writers, the people that look like Katiza, they are the ones that made the Moabites, the people that look like us, the enemies to them. They made them the enemies. And one day, so I'm going to come on and I'm going to go in and I'm going to show the extent of my biblical knowledge. I'm just a little rusty. I'm just, you know, shaking the rust off right now. I destroyed his argument that the adjectival suffix ish connected to Moabite, you know, Moabitish meant approximation. It doesn't mean approximation. It means of the nativity or country of, which was another dagger, another cut, which I'll say body bag 
or whatever y'all want to call it. It was just like, it was easy work. It was easy work. That's not what Ish means. Ish does not mean approximation. When they call her Moabitish, they mean she's of the nativity of Moab. She's, you know, a native, I should say, of, of Moab. She's of the country of Moab, nativity, dealing with birthplace. He never, in all of his slides, and all of those maps drawn by whatever biblical scholars proved that Ruth was an, was an Israelite and admitted that there was nothing in his Bible that referenced Ruth as an Israelite. So he had to give us interpretation of something that was non-existent. So I thought this was a, a easy, easy debate. I know that these brothers know their Bible and I, you know, I give them that. And I, I'm hoping that one day, that we can all put all of our information and knowledge in a pot and our debates can be done so that we could produce something else. So you got Smash and, Jamar and Jabari with the Egyptian, you know, Asar Imhotep with the linguistics, Ankh with the science, me with my research. I'm a, I'm a master researcher. You got the Hebrews that know the Bible. You got the people in, in Islam. You got the true Moorish students, the young ones, the ones that be in contact with me that I be feeding. It's time to put all of this stuff together so that we could create something to raise our people up because these instruments that were given us by the European will never, ever have the effect that you think that they're going to have. Sin and debauchery is rising in this country. It's rising across the world. Social media is showing us that. And we are at each other's throat with something we feel is uplifting. So, All right. Thank you, my brother. Whatever. Beautiful, beautiful um, debate between you two brothers. Captain Katazat, you got three minutes in this call. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you. First of all, this is the first debate I ever seen somebody pull out a source they wrote themselves and try to use it like it was credible. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's crazy bro like you know what i'm saying uh this brother lost terribly he he didn't refute one thing that i said in any way shape form or capacity and you could tell he never seen the maps a day in his life they got to come on here and talk conspiracy because i showed you exactly where the book of ruth and when it took place you know what i'm saying he's like I, I, he has no idea what to do about that. i've never seen this before and then once again like if i'm gonna ask you simple questions and you're gonna say i don't know I don't know, back to back to back, get completely deflated. Why do I trust you as an authority anywhere else when you don't even know the law of kinsmen? You thought, you thought Ruth was the kinsman. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's absolutely crazy. You don't know the Bible. You don't listen. Maybe, you know, something in, you know, that, you know, the, the place you left in the Morris Science Temple, you should leave the Bible alone. You're not an authority on it any way, shape, form or capacity. But what we did show today you understand we being the ISUPK is that Ruth is without a shadow of a doubt an Israelite that was in the land of Reuben. You understand who so who's whose brothers from the land of Judah so joined with her and she went back onto them. Once again, anybody else would have pulled their own source. Y'all would have laughed him into oblivion. Yeah, uh, I wrote this and uh, just believe it because, you know, it's it's my words. It's true. And, you know, we should just believe anything that I say. No, you got to prove it. And you didn't prove nothing, bro. This was a layup. So Sa got to go. He, he looked like he ready to run off the screen, bro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, oh, one last thing. One last thing. This is what's crazy. He talk about people that look like me, and then he pulled the Talmud. You pulled Talmudic sources? Like, that's crazy, bro. You can't say, these are the people that changed it, and then go to their source like it's going to be credible? Nah, bro, that's fraudulent. All right, so let me, let me just All say right, we done. briefly. No doubt, no doubt. Oh, so, so, so he gets another is, response? No, no, this is their okay, good. I'm That's good. I'm crazy. Good. This is I'm the done. toughest environment to be in, and we're busting piñatas. All right, peace and black power. Thank y'all. And hey, Captain Katazar, thank you, man. Don't let this be the last time. People are out there. They thirsty for that 12 tribe debate, that 12 tribe chart debate. Um, I think you, you I better think, get somebody worthy. Yeah, well, we got we got brothers out there like um uh uh, Elder Yara. Elder Yara is a powerful, powiful brother. He yeah, debated right. Captain Tazoriak like twice. I think he smoked Captain one time. And matter of fact, you was the goddamn moderator on the no, debate. No, I, I was. And, and I like I like Yara. I'm not going to say nothing. You know what I'm saying? Even yeah. as a combatant, you know what I'm saying? He's cool yeah. people. Yeah, but somehow the, uh, the video got lost. Uh, and, you know, it is what it is. It didn't but, save, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. That video got lost mysteriously. So, um, right, like like your footage of polite from across the line, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, like that, that part. But, um, yeah, man. Peace and black power to everybody. Shalom. Thank hey, you. Yo. Peace, y'all. Peace, peace, man. Hey, check it out. You want access to all the exclusive content to Cross the Line Radio? Well, make sure you go on CrossTheLineRadio.com today and sign up now. That's the only way you're going to get it. Go do it.